All righty, everybody. Welcome back to the Manifestor Success Podcast. Today, we are back with Stuart Sim. Stuart is a former Olympian, and he is a well-known investor and trader of in <laughs> All right, cryptocurrencies. Yeah, I'll just say yeah. Yeah. he was an early board of Jakob investor, and <laughs> okay, I'll say something like that. All right. Yeah. Or you could say we had him on, and you talked about the Olympian story, and today. Okay. I, you could say say I bought my first NFT in like 2020 or something. Okay. Like, I'll say you wanna... I, I I forgot to write the little script thing. All right, um, all right, everybody, welcome back to the Manifest Your Success podcast. Today we are back with Stuart Sim. Um, we had Stuart on about a couple months ago for an Olympian episode, so be sure to check that out if you haven't. But Stuart bought his first NFT back in 2020, and today we're going to be talking about his journey in NFTs and crypto. It's good so, to have you here, Stuart. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Kyle. Good to be back. And uh, yeah, really appreciate the last podcast that I came out really well. So happy to be on again. Right. Yeah. So J Sam just said that you bought your first NFT in 2020, which is it's kind of the story from a lot of people. They're sitting at home and they don't really have anything to do. And they're like, oh, let me buy an NFT and see what happens. So like, what was your what was your mindset? Like, how involved were you in crypto when you first bought your NFT? And what was so appealing to the space? Like when you were first looking at it? Yeah, so the I guess I'll separate NFT and, and crypto um, just kind of quickly. So crypto, I've been excited about for pretty much 10 years now. I, I was on a business kind of underground uh, business forum called Black Hat World. Uh, yeah, just over 10 years ago. And that was my introduction to Bitcoin. And I remember trying to buy Bitcoin on Mount Gox in 2011 or so when it was like sub $1 and I was under 18. So I, I don't think I could actually set up uh, like a PayPal to get money into Mount Gox, but I like had been around Bitcoin, saw Dogecoin launch around that time as well as like, because people thought they'd already been priced out of Bitcoin, you know, going to 60 cents. And they're like, well, I've missed this. Um, so I've, I've enjoyed being around crypto since then, but didn't really seize the opportunity, uh, because I thought I missed it. Like I, 2013, I remember distinctly, it was like 300 bucks. And I was like telling all my friends the same story that I just said then where I was like, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to buy it at 300 bucks because I saw this at 40 cents. Um, and then that happened again in 2017 when I finally bought in. Um, and I was like, okay, I, I think this thing is sticking around and didn't do much. And then in 2020, I was actually trying to set up a DAO and, and the DAO terminology wasn't super popular uh, around then, but it was coming up enough. Um, and I wanted to set up an investment club essentially where everyone could buy in and essentially vote on investments proportionate to what, how much capital you contributed to, to the DAO. And ended up, yeah, not forming a DAO because that was kind of complicated in, in 2020 um, and ended up just stumbling into NFTs and kind of saw the link of, of DAOs and crypto into this. So I bought a like limited edition nft on super rare i haven't been on that site is i think it's super rare um mm -hmm. which i think does like limited edition artist mints um so yeah that was i think zach fox who i think is a comedian but i've got no idea um exactly that i i think he was a up-and-coming you know celebrity or something and they had an nft so that was that was the first one one i bought yeah so i guess um you've been in you've been observing this space for so long was there ever I know you said you kind of stumbled across that group that you've been a part of was there ever really anyone that you knew that maybe introduced you or kind of um got you involved in this space or was it just it kind of sounds like maybe it was you that were trying to get other people like your friends involved yeah so in in 2020 with the pandemic and everything I, I totally got on the the clubhouse um clubhouse train and spent hours, hours in the in clubhouse rooms, mostly kind of like I said, kind of chatting about 
investments. And, and then I think it was a random group. It, it was no one in particular. And I wish I could remember the guy's name who was like, what you've just described to me is a DAO. And then I was like, okay, I'm starting to look at what this DAO thing is. And I think look at uh, Aragon, which was the like a DAO launching platform. Um, so it wasn't really mentor mentors. I think I was one of the first people in a lot of my peer group. I mean, definitely my in real life peer group by far to get on the NFT train. Um, and then most of it was just through through Twitter. And what I started to see with Twitter and yeah, really around NFTs um, was the Board Ape Yacht Club. And I was already looking into DAOs. I already had um, some thoughts around Bitcoin. And, and I think this is a, a Reddit meme where it's like, have, have Bitcoin and get into the Citadel. If you've got to be over like one Bitcoin to get into the Citadel or something like that. Um, and then, yeah, I, I just kind of saw people on Twitter um, who were starting to switch their profiles to this cartoon monkey in um, April or yeah, May of, of uh, 2021. And yeah, it wasn't one, one person in particular at that, at that point. Uh, it was just me kind of finding out my, my curiosities and scratching my own itch. That's awesome. So, so right now you're actually working at Fabrica, which is obviously it says a lot about what you think about the space and where it's going. If you're investing your whole career um, into something like this, so back like if you flash back back to like 2010 and like maybe up to 2020 before you actually really like got into NFTs and like DAOs, like you said, like what was your view on like the space in general? Was it really just like okay, these are some coins that I can make some money off of, or like like what was your perspective on what like Bitcoin was and NFTs? Yeah, initially I I totally bought into this idea of kind of Bitcoin as a store of value, like a gold analog. Like I believe that narrative, um, I believe or kind of understood to some degree the idea of other countries having like high or terrible inflation problems um, and not necessarily um, having access to US dollars, like the, the cost of US dollars is just too high for a lot of developing nations, uh, like individuals in developing nations to, to get, like if you travel to a South America or whatever, it's like they really want US dollars and they'll give you a discount essentially if you give them US dollars because it's just too hard for them to get. And then you think of the idea, like it's, it's still a fun one where it's like, banks like why are banks closed you know only open from you know 9 to 10 a.m to like 4 p.m monday through friday and it's just such a pain and i was like okay it's a meme now but you know through the 2010s i was like bitcoin can fix this and that's that's as much as i really thought into it and i honestly totally missed ethereum when it kind of was launching and, and really only got introduced to that like properly at the end of 2020, because I had this um, history for in 2017 and stuff of of the shit coins and everything. When I was like, I was like, no, no shit coins. That's my just number one rule. So I was kind of like a, a Bitcoin maximalist. And to my earlier point, I I really, it's kind of classist and kind of sucky to to think like this, but the way I was guessing or the way I still kind of think things will play out is this idea of um, okay blockchain is public and if if people can publicly like verify that you own more than one bitcoin will that give you certain benefits and I, I just really believed in that and then when nfts came along I was like okay this is better than this idea of proving that someone has one bitcoin which is just like a monetary thing um and these nfts at least have some kind of taste component to it but a lot of this and this isn't like a real funny like mentor or anything but to answer kind of sam's first question is a lot of that thinking comes from this like terrible justin timberlake movie 
called um, In Time. Um, have, have either of you guys seen that? I have not, no. Okay, so this came out in 2011. Um, it's definitely worth a watch. Justin Timberlake, Olivia Wilde. Um, the premise is that everyone stops aging when they're 25 years old and their life expectancy is essentially a digital tattoo on their wrist and it's time. So there's no money. You're, you go to work and you earn time. And as soon as your digital clock on your wrist goes to zero, you die. And what happens is there's like massive wealth inequality and the rich people have like thousands of years where the poor working class has like minutes, if not hours. And you can go through different neighborhoods based on how much time you've got on your wrist um and yeah i was like ah oh, that that to me i see like obviously not to that level like i don't think you should be dying if you don't have a specific nft but i i, I see this idea of nfts as um like access yeah yes yeah. so it sounds like you really like believed in the mission from the start you saw that it was like what it was addressing the inflation and and like this this authority and sometimes it, most of the time it can get corrupt eventually over time um so i'm curious when you first like saw back to when you first saw these monkeys like you're scrolling twitter and you see these monkeys popping up on people's profile pictures like what did you think of it and then like did you just dive into research and just or just randomly buy one like what was your path like after you saw all these people jumping into nfts yeah so what really stuck out to me then, and again, a non-mentor mentor, mentor um, I had listened to this podcast with Greg Eisenberg and uh, I can't remember the guy's name, but he's like the co-founder of On Deck, which is like a new startup accelerator kind of trying to take on YC essentially. And what they were talking about on that podcast was this idea of community building and how it's really interesting that with like YC, if, if, if you see um, a founder who gets into YC, which is Y Combinator, which is probably the yeah, most famous startup um, uh, incubator or accelerator, I guess, um, is that a lot of the founders will put like YC and then their class um, in their Twitter profile. So it's like, YC summer 22, uh, 20, which is, yeah, year, yeah, 2020. And it's this, and like YC um, didn't tell them to do that. They just did it. And then same at uh, On Deck, these founders who participate in the program, all of a sudden without On Deck asking them, were like, oh, we're part of On Deck, you know, winter one, summer two, whatever. And I was like, and they made a big point about how, there's something special when people make their identity part of something else or get something else and make that part of their identity without you being asked. And that's exact. And that was one of my favorite podcasts, like before the board apes happened. And then all of a sudden, yeah, I like see that it's Twitter. So they're talking about Twitter originally, which is funny. And I was on Twitter and then all of a sudden I start to see a couple of these like similar monkey pictures as people's profiles um and that's that's how i knew i was like okay this this is bitcoin is is not cool and i would feel weird and i feel even weirder now you know kind of talking about that in real life because it is so kind of polarizing but i was like okay this this i think people are willing to get behind laser eyes laser eyes for bitcoin maxis stupid but everyone was loving these these uh these jpegs um and yeah so that was kind of why i was looking at that and honestly i was i was just pissed off that i knew a bunch of people who had made a lot of money on dogecoin and i was like you know what i've i've been looking at bitcoin for over a decade and i'm not filthy rich i'm not even rich um, for how long I've known about Bitcoin. So, and here come a bunch of people who make hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in Dogecoin. Um, and I was like, I, I've, I'm going to, I'm going to play into this, uh, board ape thing. Yeah. I, I guess a couple of things. One, I feel like a lot of people, when they get into the crypto space, it's almost like 
it's almost like instinct to go through the the initial Bitcoin maximalism phase. Um, like you read the white paper, you discover Bitcoin, you're like, okay, this is all that matters. And then eventually you kind of start to branch out and be like, okay, wow, there's actually other applications of this. Like some of these things are important too. But um, I think I, I, I see what you mean there um, in that, like all the people you were seeing on Twitter, because um, I actually, I'd been a long time follower of yours because I think you had, you were investing in some of the same stocks as me. So um, I would follow you. And I remember I had your post notifications on and you were tweeting about, about buying uh board apes and you were tweeting about how that like like oh so and so just hit whatever and like and i just kept seeing him i was instantly dismissed i was like what is this never seen it before i have no clue what this guy's even talking about i think you were the only person that i followed that because i just wasn't following the right people or whatever and that's just always haunted me but i'm curious you know since you were um early along with the launch of board ape and things like that did you ever consider um maybe some of the older NFTs that were already around, like CryptoPunks or CryptoKitties, were you ever following those at all? Yeah, you know, I, I kind of miss that again. Like it, it's what's what's kind of funny is I think I came across Bored Apes be before I really came across CryptoPunks. <laughs> so it, it was like really lucky that, um, that that was the first project that I really legitimately came across like i said i bought my first like limited edition artist nft in the uh december of, of 2020 um so i can't really remember if i did really crypto punks or um yeah crypto kitties after like oh, since the times passed i can imagine in my mind like, like I've, I've seen the images and I'm like, oh, I'm pretty sure I did see that early, but I, I never thought about it. So yeah, it was, was super new to me. Um, and like I said, I, 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 and like you kind of said just then is, is I was kind of a Bitcoin maxi and, and I, I didn't want to look at anything Ethereum because I didn't understand the programmability um, of it um, when I just to uh, Kyle's point, was thinking about the inflation hedge of of Bitcoin essentially. Um, so yeah, crazy that Bored Apes was one of the ones that I kind of came across pretty pretty early. Yeah, I think I also remember um, another thing you had been tweeting about early on was Sushi Swap. I remember you were you were an early advocate of Sushi Swap. I'm curious um, how you kind of came across that and what made you recognize where the, where there was utility in Sushi Swap. Yeah, so that was an interesting one where i think i i think i probably lost money on that trade but i was up like quite a bit um for, for quite a while of that trade um and what i liked about sushi swap was to go back to my third or one of my points about bitcoins is like how banks are operating and sushi swap is essentially a, a platform that lets you uh that has a couple of different products in it uh, one of them is like you can swap different coins. So just like on Coinbase, how you can swap cash or ETH or Bitcoin for uh, many other coins. Um, Sushi Swap essentially does that as well, um, but it's a de decentralized org um, and yeah, just has like different, I guess, a different interface and, and product suite than, than Coinbase. So that was one thing where I was like, oh, this is great. Like I see everyone wanting to buy these these shit coins and and other coins and and sushi swap and uniswap um seem to be um like good products for that but the reason i specifically liked sushi swap over uniswap was for this um kind of lending and borrowing requirement where I haven't looked at the interest rates um, and this kind of plays into some potentially dangerous like DeFi territory if you don't know what you're doing or don't understand where the yields kind of come from, which I frankly don't know a huge amount of details. But interest rates now are like, what, 5 6%. Um, I'm pretty sure if you go on SushiSwap right now, you can swap, you, you, uh, you can borrow essential US dollars for 0.5 to 3%. And I was like, this is, my, and, and I can do that with it a click. I don't need to speak to a banker. I can just show that I've got some amount of funds and I'm going to get 
up to, I'm going to have a borrow limit of up to 60% on that. It's essentially margin lending, um, kind of. Um, and I can just click a couple buttons and all of a sudden I can withdraw, you know, 10, 20 grand into a, into my bank account with a couple of clicks. And as an Australian who's, you know, living in the U S and doing a bunch of travel, um, I was, yeah, like you guys mentioned on the Olympic team, don't have the best financial like job history um, with that kind of like time off where if I want to go get a loan, they're going to ask for my last two pay stubs and being on the Olympics does not pay you well. Um, so I, there's no way I would qualify for these loans. And here I come across Sushi Swap where all of this is essentially um, all of the extra stuff or extra details around lending is kind of abstracted away and it's very clear cut. It's like you put in money and you can borrow up to 50, 60% based on that money. And we're going to keep your deposit if that changes, uh, if, if, if you like blow through that. So uh, that was really exciting to me. Uh, so yeah, multiple products, a swapping product, an awesome looking lending platform, which was more or less and still is honestly i think one of the easiest to use financial products that i've i've come across if you ask me to like navigate my chase banking app and send wire transfers and get loans i wouldn't have a clue how to start so that was what i liked about sushi swap yeah that that's so cool like looking in like to defi compared to like regular like banking and stuff like you have to look at all the routing numbers and all these things you got to text them and like if that gets exposed some way, then it could leak their whole bank account and then they're messed up. Um, also, I'm I'm curious, like, so flashing back to like NFTs and like when when I when I kind of like got introduced to NFTs and understood what they really were, I feel like most people in the space were kind of just trading them for for a, a trade and to make a profit out of. But I guess you're someone that was kind of earlier in on the space, at least for Board Ape Yacht Club. So what was like? Was was that the mindset of like most people like in the community? Because I'm I'm sure you were in the Discord and you had some conversations with people. So like, what was like the main reason for people joining this NFT space? Was it mostly to even trade like that early, or was it more because like the programming and the ownership side of it, or was it just because it looked cool? Like, what, what did you see like that trend, um, going through that? Yeah, I th I think um, what excited me about the space and what I saw other people excited about was this idea of time stamping culture or um, verifiably showing your culture. And what I mean by that is, okay, so like right now you can go buy like a Michael Jordan rookie card, but, and that's cool. Like, and that's worth some money, but anyone who's got the money can buy a Michael Jordan rookie card and and that does, and it shows you kind of like Michael Jordan or might, might want to profit, but it doesn't show that you saw something in Michael Jordan in his rookie year. Um, it doesn't prove that, like it might happen, but, and that's, that's what I think was super appealing to the very early group of NFT users is you can look at mostly artists um, and that comes in form of you know musicians or um like digital artists um illustrator kind of kind of folk um and you can buy something of theirs and verifiably show that you were first or you were early um so my favorite example of one of these that i did was uh pool suite um, with with Marty, um, if you guys are familiar with that, he's got like the retro, um, like old school computer looking website. If you if you type in poolsuite.fm, um, and I was like, he was an artist that I really believed in, and I wanted to buy his first NFT, um, just thinking that, yeah, just as kind of verifiable support, so that when people look at me and go, you know, it's kind of like, I'm painting a picture of a very like capitalistic world with my in time thing. And then this of like, like proving who the cool people are, but like taste matters. 
Um, and I prefer people that can prove their taste um, based on their like true interactions and time versus their, their dollars. Because that way you and I, we're, all, we're essentially competing at an equal level. And if I can um, buy an NFT from Marty, you know, a year before he launches the, the pool suite NFT collection, like I feel good and I'm excited and, and the people that whose opinions I do care about um, probably care about that more so than um, just showing that they were able to, you know, drop hundreds of thousands of dollars on a super rare crypto punk or, or board ape. Um, so that was the first early group. That was what I felt like the sentiment was in the really in those first like couple of months of, of 2021, it was people trying to collect and show that they were on top of ultimately like pop culture. Yeah. I think um, it really and then is. yeah, it descends into price. Yeah. I really think it is a fascinating thing. Like, that people really don't understand in the space. Obviously, like when you're looking at NFTs and you just see them jump in from like millions of dollars down to like 10,000 back up to millions, like you don't really understand like why that technology is so valuable. And like, it's literally giving ownership to someone and it's and it's recording when they bought it. And it's a public, like it's on the blockchain that anyone can see. So like, I just think like most people, when they first think of NFTs, I just really wanted to emphasize that point. Like they give ownership to someone and that ownership will grant you in, in a sense, higher status if you're in a project that's successful. And I think that's just awesome for, for society. Yeah. And I think what you, as cliche as it does sound, like it does prove like who the, the cool people are, right? Maybe not like, obviously not the right word, but, and, and you kind of see that it's, it's almost transferable to something like social tokens too, you know, like how many times have you found a, like an artist or a, a YouTube channel that was at like nothing and you're like, okay, I'm this guy's 10th subscriber. Or I'm this guy's fifth listener. And then all of a sudden, like five years later, they're a big thing. And you're like, wow, nobody knows that I was, I was the first person to listen to this guy. Like, I wish I could prove this. It's, it's that exact same thing. That's exactly it. When Taylor Swift, you know, a month ago sells, like completely sells out, you know, her, her tour and the, the resale prices are astronomical, you know, I don't know, tens of thousands of dollars. I, I, I didn't try to buy. So, are you a big Taylor um, Swift fan, Stuart? Yeah, you know, I mean, who's who's not really? Um, <laughs> but you know, like, why? To exactly what you said, um, Sam is why? How how does Taylor reward her first one thousand true listeners? You know, who yeah might not be able to afford these tens of thousands or of dollars of tickets, but those initial fans, you know, kind of what made like a big part of, of Taylor's journey. And I think the blockchain and NFTs are a way to reward that. And it's, yeah, I, I totally agree, Sam. That, that was another reason why I liked NFTs was, was just proving that. Like I was on these newsletters early, like um, like uh, Packy McCormick's um, Not Boring. Like I was within the first 2,000 subscribers of his newsletter um drew riley at trends who i should actually probably give some uh, quite a bit of credit to trends.vc um was kind of part of that clubhouse era of like finding cool things on the internet um and yeah like i don't know it, it's weird that i say that i want some credibility or some way to prove that I was one of Packy's first first readers or one of Drew's Drew's first. Um, yeah, I think that's a great way to way to do it is NFTs. Yeah, shout out Packy McCormick. I've been messaging him on Twitter trying to get him to, to come on the podcast. He hasn't responded yet. But uh, yeah, well, I, if, I love if I could show. Letter. Yeah, if I could show that I was an early supporter, then I could give that to you, and then you could get him on. You know, that's that's how <laughs> exactly. I want this to work. Yeah, but I like so what I you guess... guys are doing. Sorry, with, with the podcast, I'm like, this is what I love. It's like you guys are kind of publicly showing people and conversations you're having super well. I don't know. In my case, I think it's it's pretty early. <laughs> I'm trying to trying to make it big. And I'll, I'll remember you guys, and you know, you guys will be the, the first guys to have me as uh back to back guests. So hopefully we'll have some NFTs launched soon and you can uh, invest in those and, and maybe you'll yeah. get rewarded out of that. 
for sure. Not financial advice. <laughs> yeah. But th- that means a lot. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so I guess kind of up, up until this point, you've kind of, you've been, you've been an observer, you've been kind of investing in different things. At what point did you maybe decide, hey, I want to, I want to contribute to this space. I want to maybe work in at this place or see how I can contribute to so-and-so. Like, when did you first get involved in actually actively working in the crypto space? Yeah, so the first, I've been teaching myself how to code over the last, I guess it's two years now, it's December of 2022. Um, so for the last two years, I've been teaching myself how to code. Um, and a year ago, I started to just teach myself by trying to code projects related to crypto space. So actually the first time that I seriously tried to get involved in the space was back in, in 2017 um, when I created a site called Bitcoin or Stocks. Um, and it essentially just showed like a, a graph with the gains of Bitcoin versus the gains of stocks. And it's like, what idiots going to invest in stocks when Bitcoin is up, you know, 20,000%. Um, obviously, probably stocks, some stocks might have been a better investment since um, 2017. But that was probably the first like real crypto contribution. Well, I mean, it wasn't even a crypto project per se. Like it was just like a regular website, just happened to be around crypto. Um, and then most recently at the start of this year, Again, teaching myself how to code, I made a um, like an image pixelator. Like I started seeing, like I mean, CryptoPunks is essentially pixels. Saw a bunch of other super cool um, pixeled image projects, and I was like, oh, I wonder if I can turn my um, NFTs or some images into cool looking pixel art. Uh, so made a little website about that. Um, from there, made a directory um, called cafemoon.xyz. And essentially, that's got 350 projects or businesses around crypto. So it's like, if you want to start a DAO, it's really hard to know where to start. And the idea behind Cafe Moon was to be like, okay, here are 15 tools um, that help you make, make a DAO or you want to launch an NFT, okay, great, go on Cafe Moon and within a couple of clicks, you can see six different NFT launches. Um, so that was the idea for that. Um, and then uh, my most recent personal one um, has been Dream Chat, which is a, a wallet-to-wallet messaging platform, um, which I'm super excited about. And then, yeah, decided to go full-time uh, in the space um at at fabrica.land which is putting real estate in your wallet and that's by converting real property into an nft as proof of ownership and yeah that's that's what i do um during my day these days yeah. i think it's i think that's awesome that you said you're teaching yourself how to code for anyone listening to this it's like literally nothing stopping you from getting into a space whether it be web3 or something else like you can literally go online and teach yourself how to do it. If you just have the fortitude to do it, you can literally do it. So I'm curious, like, what are some of the best resources that you found um, to teach yourself how to code, whether it be in Web3 specifically or um, Web2 and coding in general? Yeah, so starting to code, every everything's different um, depending on what you want to do. But if you want to kind of like make websites and apps, um, the basics are kind of HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and ultimately React is what I've been teaching myself. Um, my favorite instructor, and I've bought some of his paid courses, is uh, developedbyed.com, developedbyed.com. Um, I've got no affiliation or anything, but I think he is an amazing uh, instructor or whatever. Um, so I totally recommend uh, his courses. But pretty much it's a combination of, of YouTube, a couple of paid courses, and then I do like uh, Udemy as well, udemy.com. I think um, I'm doing a course like a, a React Native, which is essentially trying to make a mobile app. Um, so convert Trainjet to, to mobile. And there's a guy called Maximilian on that. But pretty much, uh, yeah, can be super daunting. So what I would say is just think of a project you want to make 
um, jump on YouTube, Udemy or whatever, like you can do this for sure, for free through YouTube. Um, just kind of watching other people's tutorials to try to make something similar to what you want to make um, and then altering the code or once you've learned the basics, you can then ultimately, um, yeah, create, create what you want. But yeah, definitely if you like computers and want to make stuff, I think learning to code now is easier than it as it ever has been. I remember trying to teach myself again, like 10 years ago and it was just impossible. Like I was trying to buy books, books on Amazon, you know, about JavaScript and then like by the time I get the like, then I realized the book's written in like 2001 or something and just I can't figure out how to get it to work on my computer. Whereas now YouTube is is underratedly awesome for, for learning how to code. I couldn't agree more with everything you just said. Um, I'm curious. So like, obviously you were in the Olympics, which we touched on a lot in that previous episode. So like you're coming out of the Olympics and like, obviously you're like, okay, I'm done with the Olympics. Um, not really rowing as, as hard as I am going to be obviously because the Olympics is over. So did you just kind of jump into web three and like, you didn't even think about any other things or like, when did you burn the bridges and realize, okay, I really want to do web three and like continue to, to push at this. And like, why did you commit to it so much? Yeah. So I, yeah, what was interesting was I wrapped up the Olympics. So that was in Tokyo and I'd already been, yeah, this was now, I guess, end of July of 2021. So I'd, I'd been in the like NFT kind of mindset for the previous, like, I guess, eight, eight to nine months, um, but probably like pretty seriously for the first uh, for the previous four or five months. And yeah, like when you're training for the Olympics, it's not like you've got time for another job or anything. So that's why I was teaching myself how to code and then kind of, yeah, looking at the, at the JPEGs and everything um, as a way to turn my mind off from, from rolling. Um, and I initially actually got offered and accepted a job at a venture capital firm back in Australia. Um, called Airtree, and they're the they're the number one, number one venture firm uh, in Australia. Really good bunch of people, and I was yeah wanting to pursue the just general investment side. Like I I knew that they were investing in crypto. Um, like uh, Immutable, I think was one of their their bigger and earlier crypto investments, and that's paid off huge. So I I knew that they were going to be playing more inside the crypto space, and I was like, great, that's um, a good way for me to to jump into crypto, which I like still and do believe um, kind of has a lot of future potential to to work into. So accepted that job, but then actually ultimately I couldn't fly home to Australia because of COVID restrictions. Um, so ended up having uh, like choosing to stay in America partially because I couldn't couldn't get home um, and left that job. And then yeah, it was like okay even in my one or two months at, at that fund, realized that, that I wanted to just really be on the, the crypto operator side, just knowing that there's a huge amount of cool stuff being built um, and that I could enjoy the exposure to the entire industry by coding something like um, Cafe Moon um, as a way for me to like collect projects and, and just see what, what projects were being built. Um, but at the same time, I actually wanted to, wanted to build. So yeah, it was, it was pretty much not looking at anything else other than, than web three. I was like, I want to put my money where my mouth is. Um, believe that, you know, uh, this, this is the future, whether it's this year or, or 10 years, um, this, this is what I want to do. Yeah. I think, um, I think especially when trying to get into the web three industry to work in it, it's kind of it's kind of daunting because it's so different than like applying to a traditional job because, you know, you can't major in web three studies or stuff like that. So it's not like you can say, here's my degree and blah, blah, blah. Obviously in some cases you can say here, I'm a computer science graduate, but I'm curious, I'm not sure if this lines up, but maybe when you were um, looking to work at Fabrica, how did you kind of land that job? Were you able to say here, this is something I've worked on. This is a, a directory that I built, or this is, um, a pixelator that I built that people have used. 
Um, were you able to do that or was it just kind of like, hey, I love what you're doing. You guys look like you use some help. How can I get involved? Yeah, so um, yeah, so Fabrica, as I said, kind of operates at the intersection of real estate and crypto. I know nothing about real estate. Um, so yeah, it was the, the crypto um, side that drew me in and I was specifically, this was now kind of early 2022. So a lot of prices, it was getting very toppy. A lot of projects were rug pulling and everything. And I was like, okay, yeah, I want to work somewhere with like real utility. Um, and that's one of the companies that was on my radar. And yeah, part of the reason um, we had some great conversations was one, kind of what we've talked about on this podcast so far is that it was really easy to prove that I was part of the Web3 community. Like these guys saw my um, crypto wallet and they saw when the transactions happened and they're like, yep, okay, this guy isn't, and there's, there's nothing wrong. Like I'm excited when new people join the space, whether it's, you know, it, there are way many people earlier than me, like you said, with crypto punks and, and everything. Um, but it's, it's nice that I can like prove that I was at least doing NFT stuff since December, 2020. So there was a value add that that has to them when they say, yeah, they are a crypto native product or crypto native company. And especially in a marketing function, you probably don't want someone who's like completely BSing. Like it's really hard to, it's hard to BS around. I don't know. I don't know. Actually, I'm changing my mind as I say this. It's hard and easy to BS around crypto. Like you can use the big words like, oh yeah, blockchain will do this and NFTs and, and tokens and, um, and fractional ownership. Like everyone kind of knows the buzzwords which can be really difficult to filter out in interviewing process. So it's nice that in crypto, it's like very funny that I'm applying for a crypto job and they can just see my crypto history um, and go, okay, this guy has been around the space and we can teach him the real estate stuff and he can speak um, to the, the other kind of crypto native folk um, in ways that they're going to understand. Um, so yeah, it was it was mostly I think a reasonable part of that was was verifying it, and then yeah, absolutely right. The second part of it was that I was building my own project, and if you're in an interview with me um, and you tell me about a crypto project that's got some amount of traction, chances are I've probably heard about it. I've probably played with with the website, logged onto the app. Like I can go one for one with a lot of people um, talking about crypto projects. And a large part of that was because I built built Dream Chat and can can kind of share that. So, yeah, what I love about you guys with the podcast and everything, yeah, prove prove that you're in the space, prove that you've worked in this with some, you know, competency for some period of time, and that that definitely helps you stand out when when looking for a job. Yeah, that that sounds awesome. It it basically seems like you don't even need a resume. You just show them your wallet and you're like, look at all the projects that I've done. Look at all the, everything I've contributed to. It's all on the blockchain for you. It keeps tracks of it for you. It's kind of amazing how um, it's like, ev uh, it's evolving in society. Um, I'm curious. So like when you did hop into this, like what, what was like the group like in, in a, in a web three company like this? Cause obviously real estate, there's so many people that are in real estate. Like it's, it's just such a big industry right now, but then there's obviously web three. So was it like, was it mostly just web three people trying to get involved in real estate or was it like a blend of both people real estate and web3 yeah what so when i it was three people when i joined and we're we're already at kind of like six people now so it kind of doubled since since i've pretty much joined um the company was actually founded in 2018 um and they were literally writing uh their first property smart contract on the draft proposal for ERC 721. So they were pretty much real estate people and engineers first. And they came up um, with this idea that, yeah, like real estate should 
um, work through the blockchain and the best contract that they saw or the best um, standard that they saw developing was on Ethereum was ERC721. Um, so they pretty much became blockchain developers then. And um, since then, yeah, like brought on another, like a block, a more blockchain engineering um, type guy with, with a background at, you know, their college crypto clubs. Um, so that, that was kind of it. And then our most recent two hires um, on the engineering side of essentially um, one had pretty much zero um, Web3 experience. Um, and then one actually had just worked on a application at a hackathon for the, the Lens uh, ecosystem. But yeah, the cool thing is, um, and this is what, depending on how you're trying to learn and, and what you're trying to learn and what your interests are, What's cool now, even as opposed to probably a year or so ago, and I dare say like three years ago, is my point about like YouTube being a great resource is if you can nail down a lot of the um, like coding basics, um, whether it's like React, like JavaScript, um, front end. Um, I don't even, I'm not a coder, so I don't even know the correct words, right? But, but something like a framework. Um, like you can plug this into um, components that uh, other people have built to make Web3 integration a bit more, so a, a bit e easier. So like for right now with, with Dream Chat, um, like there are certain um, yeah, components or packages which are pre-built by somebody else and can let a relatively new self-taught engineer like myself who yeah i know about web3 but i i don't write in solidity which is the ethereum smart contract language but i can still make essentially like a quasi web3 product with like traditional um coding knowledge but that's i'm keeping my skill set like pretty limited like i'm sure there are some people right now who like at some point like right now our head of engineering is just so happen to be a blockchain expert so he can do a lot of the smart contract stuff um will we have will we hire someone in the future who's exclusively a smart contract solidity kind of developer that that could be possible but but right now i would say if, if you're interested in the space um there's there's a lot of value you can bring uh, as a software engineer or someone trying to teach themselves how to code without knowing anything too hardcore web three web three wise that's that's awesome to hear really I, I think like hearing that other people like from outside of web three are getting into web three I think that's just great for the space because obviously you need so many minds to like actually be successful and to make this thing grow um so I'm just curious like just in general like do you see where do you see like blockchain technology going like how big do you think it really gets in society or like what are some big predictions that you might have maybe under your hat that that you're like oh this is going to be big in in blockchain and it's going to disrupt this area if you have any at all <laughs> yeah i've got a couple so uh, i mean i'm working at a company which is trying to like revolutionize real estate ownership and property ownership thanks to nfts um which which is which is huge um i think the the one that I don't think is talked about enough, um, which comes back to what we've already talked about on this pod, is the idea of wallet as identity. Um, so going back to a couple of the analogies, um, I'll keep talking about the Taylor Swift one, right? Is is This is, I think, a fun use case for crypto and, and how it turns into a business. I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but okay, Taylor Swift sells out her, her tour. Could there have been a better way to organize those ticket sales? Yes, and I think blockchain through like verifiable actions, whether it's like listens when you started listening, um, things that you've done, have you like donated to Taylor Swift's favorite charity? Does that bump you up the list? And can the blockchain essentially enable that, like an open blockchain? And I, and I think the answer is, is yes. Then the second part of that is, okay, 
what can other artists then do to piggyback on that success? So let's say everyone who tries to buy a Taylor Swift ticket. Well, if I'm an up and coming artist and I can essentially through uh, on-chain data, see everyone that tried to buy a Taylor Swift ticket and I'm an artist similar to Taylor Swift and you might enjoy my music, can I somehow market, airdrop or connect with those wallet addresses in a way that I can't do with email or, you know, Facebook retargeting, you know, which seems to be a, a pretty big discussion this year is like how people use like, yeah, like targeting and um, retargeting across the internet. So and I, I think Web3 has, and blockchain and crypto, I mean, it's all kind of synonymous to some degree, um, has an awesome chance of solving um, kind of connecting and connectivity between people and and everything so so that's my 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 biggest hope and 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 thesis is that yeah like i said wallet as identity um you guys as you kind of enter the workforce yeah can you guys exclusively get a job through your through your wallet through proof of work proof of history proof of transaction that's that's what i think is gonna gonna happen at a like very high level yeah, I think that would that's such a, a tool that would be so useful and um so applicable to anyone who in, in the space, you know, so much data that's connected to your wallet that if could be pulled into one place would be such a useful tool. Um, but I guess on the topic of like the future, uh we kind of we kind of end up our podcast with the same question, which is uh what's one goal you know you might have? It could be a personal goal, a career goal, what's goal, what's one goal that you have and what steps are you taking to achieve that goal? And if you, if you can not say the same one that you said in the last episode, that would be perfect. <laughs> I'm trying to think of, yeah, I, I think I remember the last goal that, and that's why I was also um, kind of asking about the timing of our last episode, because I do want to run a three hour marathon. Um, and I ran a pretty, a reasonably casual three hour 28 marathon, like a month after that interview um i was actually helping pace my girlfriend who qualified for the boston marathon um so so i'm making good good progress for that goal that's that's next year sub three hour marathon um touched some good good uh weightlifting stuff yesterday in the gym got got my deadlift back up to 255 um trying to shoot for 315 weighing in at 145 140 pounds somewhere in that range um 225 on the bench that's that's another fitness goal um so i'm in the gym three times a week um kind of for that and and running and on the rowing machine you know a couple of other days a week uh more running when when i get closer to marathon training again so yeah those are my my physical goals um and then yeah i think my my main other like intellectual goal right now is to right now if you go to dreamchat.xyz it's a functioning uh wallet to wallet chat platform um, that you can message any wallet uh, from um, whether or not they're on the platform at that time um and sam and i have talked about this and i think sam was dead on and and it's a web app right now and and i think a mobile app and sam sam thinks a, a mobile app is is an important role for that so right now teaching myself how to how to ship or code and ship a, a fully functioning mobile app. So launch Dream Chat on mobile is uh, one of my next next goals. Dude, I think that'll be huge. Um, definitely, definitely excited for that when that happens. Yeah, th yeah. Thank you so much, man. Those are awesome goals, man. I hope I hope you keep going at it, man. Three hour marathon, dude. I'm I'd probably be like ten hours if I tried to run a marathon. So <laughs> you least. just got to train, brother. You just got to train. You could get there. I I could get you on a a routine to get you sub 330 okay yeah i'll let you know when i when i want to do that yeah. probably probably never but uh i <laughs> appreciate the offer thank you yeah. so much Stu. it was a pleasure right. talking to you man likewise awesome thanks very much guys keep it up and uh well done on the on the podcast thanks catch up sweet